What's up everyone, Scotty from Chernobyl Studios, and if I look like a red lobster glistening on a California beach, it is because it is 30 degrees Celsius in my room right now, even though it is midnight, and you know, videos gotta get done, so videos getting done. So there's that. So in this video, we are gonna discuss uh, a couple of the submission audio uh, based libraries, in particular the Grove and the Umansky. Uh, Full disclosure, I am being paid for this video. However, I have bought most of the submission audio line with my own money. So Flatline, Eurobase, I don't even know all the bases, but I have literally their entire um, library of products because I like them. So in this video, let's discuss uh, Grove and Umansky, the differences between them and which one might be right for you. Cause that's really what it all about, uh, what it is, right? We have a different select uh, we have a different selection of libraries okay and not every library is for everyone so the first thing that i want to do here is i want to discuss uh, just what this looks like right off the board right so if we look on the left here we have grow base which is a five string lefay it's a german boutique boutique i think is what the word you would you would use um so it's handmade uh, by a german guy and then on the right here we have a ding wall and this is six strings. So already we have a difference, five strings versus six strings. And, and then there are some articulation differences here, but really what's the main difference, right? Because articulation is great, you know, like, um, you know, if we, if we do, you know, double thumbing and popping and all these things, you know, I personally don't use those articulations. So really let's discuss what the sounds are. And we're going to do that very easily here. Now, when you load in uh, a DI, for example, from a bass, generally you can understand what the sound characteristics are of the DI. Just it's plugged in and played. You can understand if the strings are new, you know, by how dead it might sound or if the strings are popping, but also you can understand what characteristics it has as far as tonal capabilities. Is it thick? Is it round? Is it clanky? Uh, is it thin? Is it more mid-range focused? Does it have a honk to it? These are things that you can determine and decide based on the DI if you want to use those or not. And this is the exact same case for these two bass libraries from Submission Audio. So let's just go ahead and check out the straight DI. I have no processing on this. This is all disabled processing. We're listening just to the DIs. You saw me change it to the DI in the video just now. So let's listen to the Grove and the Umansky. So I would classify that as being a thick, round sound, right? It's not very clanky. Um, it just, it really holds down a thick low end, just like really beefy, really has a lot of depth and girth, right? So that's the Grove. What about the Umansky? All right, so there's the clank. Uh, I would definitely call that a, an extremely clanky bass. Um, not so much uh, thick or round in the low end like the Grove is, but the Umansky is ultra clanky and it's a ding wall, you know? It's kind of one of those bases where a lot of people are using them right now in metal because it has the clank and the type of clarity that you might want to use to go through dense mixes or if you are doing more solo type of stuff because um, we'll talk about the articulations in just a little bit, but we can already tell the major difference here between the Grove and the Umansky is the tone of the bass itself. The Grove, very thick, very round. The Umansky, very clanky, has a lot of attack. Not so much, I mean, it has thickness, like let's, you know, it's got low end punch, but it's not nearly as round and thick. Like the Grove is just bringing the booty in spades here. So other than a major sound difference, what are we looking at in terms of you know articulations? You know, what do we see different here? Oops. And then why would it matter? Okay, so if we just look at this, first glance is like, all right, yeah, big deal. What's the difference? There are a couple of key differences here. First of all, we have the extra string over here on the ding wall. Um, it's not an extra low string, it's an it's an uh, extra high string. So if you are doing a lot of 
more complicated runs or soloing or things like that. You have the extra string up top here to get more notes in, whereas this does not. They are both essentially in the same tuning, i.e. the low B string. This is a low B and this is a low B, okay? And so they are the same tuning as it were, but we just have more uh, extended range here with the, the Dingwall or the Yamansky with the higher string. Now, they're both finger articulated. There's no pick with any of these uh, libraries here. If you want to pick, I believe you're going to need to go with the Euro bass or something like that, or the, or the gym bass, I think, as well. So these are pick arti uh, excuse me, finger articulations only, but if you look down here in the bottom left, we can see all of the different articulations that come with the bass. So, you know, finger alternate latch, I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, that's the, the default, okay? And then we can actually tell the bass you know, hey, I want to use the index finger, I want to use the middle finger, or I want to do ghost notes, or I want a slap note here, a ghost slap, a pop, a ghost pop, harmonics, uh, hammer-ons and pull-offs, tapping, and a slide trigger, okay? Now, all of those same articulations exist in the Umansky, except that the Umansky has um, a couple of extra articulations, such as a dead slap, dead pop, harmonics, hammer-on, pull-offs, but has the dead double thumb, uh, has a thump, okay, a double thumb articulation. So the double thumb pop and the front hand mute. So this uh, gives itself more playability articulation if you use the uh, slapping and the popping and the thumb and the double thumb, you know, in real life. Now for me, I don't do that kind of stuff. So if, if you realize, hey, I'm just a meat and potatoes guy, I just want a thick bass, I just want some figure articulation. I don't care about double thumbs. Then you don't need Umansky. You can go with Grove. The difference would be that, ah, uh, but I want that Dingwall sound. Well, okay, then that's the other reason why you might want the Umansky over the Grove. So it's good to understand the differences here. Okay, and then the range, you know, are the are basically the same. I think it's C0 for both. Yeah, C0 to C5 for both bases. But like I said, the actual bass itself is just a low B. All the notes below um, the B here are, are, I'm assuming, artificially tuned in software somehow to get to those lower registers. For example, if we play this, um, I recorded this song in drop A. If we watch the fretboard here, you see these numbers that say like one and the other one will say two. It means it's going below the actual range of the physical instrument that was sampled, and you're having tuned the notes there. So just something to keep in mind. It really doesn't matter. I mean, it's just something to keep in mind. Right. Other than that, the, the interfaces are pretty well the same. You know, we have our snapshots here for presets on both situations, both instruments. We have alternate picking algorithm on both. We have the doom button. We have the humanize, which I always set to human. Um, and then the major difference is here also you have an OD and a distortion and a lead. Um, oh, what, what, I would call them pedals, I guess. I, they're not pedals, but sound options. Let's say sound options. Um, and the Masky, we got a clean grit and a heavy. Okay, just as well, both of them have the mixer section here. So you can go between fretboard and mixer. Here, generally, based on the preset you might be using, you can have different um, options, you know, drive, tone, you can compress it, add more girth effects, so on and so forth. For example, if I were to select an OD default, it already defaults that it's a bright switch is turned on, there's a drive um, fader here and a compressed fader and a girth fader if I wanna use that, okay? Uh, but you can turn them on like I just did. You know, so it's not, there's nothing stopping you, you can create your own stuff here, all right? now. This is cool. I mean, we have the technicalities out of the way. We know what it sounds like with the DI and all these things like that. But, you know, how hard is it to use them? What's it like to program with it? What's that latch thing that we were just talking about? Let me show you. So when you're programming bass, all right, here it is. Uh, it's sort of similar to programming drums. You just need to know what notes you're playing. Um, and uh, just a quick tip. When programming bass, in my opinion, you know, maybe I'm speaking more as a mixer here, I like the bass to be as slow as possible that makes sense for the song that is being played. You know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm a guy that just likes the bass to do the bass stuff. You know, I'm not a solo bassist. If I was a bass player, maybe I would have a different point of view. But that said, I do like the extra control I have to tell the bass what to do if I know specifically something needs to happen, which is what, let me just do this, which is what these um, uh, notes up here and down here are telling me. So in the upper register here, these are um, the latch articulations where I'm telling the instrument which string to play on, okay? So let me show you. So if we look up here, I can force the, the bass to part to be played on a specific string. So if I want the B string, I can do that. If I want a D string, I can do that. And in some cases I am, and I'll show you why. So let's go back to the fretboard. And let me show you this riff right here. So watch the fretboard. So it's just, there's two octave notes, dun, 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 dun. Basically how I'm playing it on the guitar, right? When I don't do this, for example, you'll get weird, funky things happening like this. Now, um, it sounds weird, and it also looks weird because you wouldn't play like this, right? So we're kind of choking up on the bass here, but if I tell the bass, no, I don't want to play it on the freaking B string on the 12th fret, I want to do octaves. They're the same notes, but they're being played in a different position on the fretboard. But in this way, by telling uh, the instrument where it can play the notes, we're getting the sound that we're expecting, right? And that's a great feature about the, the, the submission audio library in general, being able to be like, oh my God, normally I don't particularly care, but when it comes to these octaves or for example, um, hammer-ons and pull-offs, if I'm doing something like that on the guitar or something that's really notey, it'll sound weird if it's just, uh, I have an example actually, I can just show you. Here we go. So I'm switching between forcing the bass to play between the index and the middle finger right now. And it sounds like this. It's just going back and forth between an open note and a fretted note. I'm sure there are bass players who are like, oh, Scott, that's pretty easy. You know what the big, what the big deal is. Um, I can be like, yeah, you know what? Let's do hammer-ons and pull-ups on that section. So I'll pick or I'll, I'll you know, use the finger on the first note and then the rest of them need to be all hammer-on pull-ups, like this. So it does actually sound a bit different. So when we're doing with the fingers, every note is like very clearly articulated. And sometimes with bass, yeah, I don't know if you're gonna get that kind of articulation sometimes in lower tunings. So we can just do the hammer-on, we're still playing the same notes. They're just a bit more like blended together, right? They're not so like chuck, 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 chuck. They're more blended together with the hammer-on pull-off sequence, okay? Uh, so that's as far as programming the bass. Uh, it's very simple to do. It's very straightforward. I like how you cannot confuse um, like the articulations because they're on the left versus what string I want to be played on, which is all the way on the right side of the keyboard here. That's great. I, you know, sometimes you can get confused. Um, if everything's jumbled together, it's like, oh my God, what am I doing? But not the case here. And it's literally the same for Umansky. Like there's no difference. So if we just scoot over to the uh, Umansky here, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same note. We're just, we're going to have a different sound, right? So the only thing that really has changed is the actual sound of the bass itself, you know, which is this. Now with this bass, those uh, hammer-on and pull-ups are far more articulated because the bass is more clanky, so we're getting more articulation with the note. We're not, but again, we're sac sacrificing, if you want to use that word, the low end, the girthiness of the other bass, the Grove bass. And if we look at this, you know, I am forcing the bass to play on. It's the E string, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I'm forcing the be played on the E string because that's how I'm playing it on the guitar actually. So it's being played on the E string. Now what would happen if that's not the case? Maybe still possible, but um, perhaps, but you're really increasing the skill required of, of a bass player to do something like that. So why do that? Just play it on the... On the Easy, just like that. So it's uh, programming the bass is quite simple. 
Um, you don't have to do a lot. And it really comes down, I think, the decision of which base library you want here, for example, is what sound are you going for? You want a thick, uh, deep bass, or you want more of a clanky bass? If you want more of a clank clank, you need Umansky. If you want a thick, you know, deep bass, you're gonna go with the Grove, all right? Now, the last thing I'd like to discuss is how easy is it to work with these things in a mix, okay? And Submission Audio has pretty much made this a science. If you're using one of their libraries, it's pretty darn simple. Um, like, this is my chain. This is pretty much, if I'm using a Submission Audio bass, this is all I use. I have one EQ, I use their double tap plugin, which replaces all of the other compression things I've ever done, and then MicroShift, which is just, um, it's a, it's a mixing decision that I like to make, all right? So, the demo song here that I have, I've recorded. Uh, by complete accident, I really like this one. The OD default just seems to cut through well. Um, and that will be what I would suggest. If you don't know which preset to use, play your rough mix with the drums and the and the guitars, press play, and then go through the presets and see which one kind of jumps out to you. The one that jumps out will already be a good choice in my opinion because you will have to do less to it to make it uh, be heard in the mix. If you pick a preset that like disappears in the song that you're working on, uh, you know, you're just gonna make the job harder for yourself. So that's too honky for me. I don't want to do that one. So I found this hot and scooped one, but it really, all the low end just falls out of the mix. Let's see what we can do here. Maybe we can adjust the, the compress and the drive here a little bit. Maybe get some of the thickness back. Actually, I think I see the culprit right now. I think it's this girth button. I'm going to stay with the OD default. I think it just sounds better. Um, now let's move on to the EQ. So we have the preset. I mean, by the way, you can use the DI if you want and use parallax. I mean, it's up to you, okay? Or the dark glass or something, totally, totally feasible. But just for the sake of this video, I'm just showing you the presets and how easy it is to work with the bass with nothing else, right? So let's go to the EQ. Um, let's just dump this to a default and see what we got going on. Here's another reason why submission audio basses are usually very easy to work with. They're right where you want them to be. Like if you were mixing a bass, a real one, you would be striving to get this kind of DI signal or kind of signature, you know, in, in, a, in a final product. Um, so almost I can do this blind. I know I'm gonna need a low cut here. I'll literally just put it at 70 and these are just these aren't the final moves, but I just from working with these for so many times, I know I'm gonna be in the ballpark. All right, and I know there's usually some kind of uh, stuff I wanna pull out around five to 700. So I'll just make a node there, okay? Here we go, let me press play. So that's the extent of the kind of EQ that I would do on the bass like this because it's kind of already done for us. All right. Uh, next will be double tap and <laughs> this is it. Um, the tooltips are pretty much, they tell you exactly what to do. One to two orange lights, 
I think this is green, two greens. There we go. I've just turned down the lowing a little bit after doing uh, the low comp. There we go, base is done. The last thing that I like to do is I like to add this micro shift plugin, which is kind of like um, a sort of a bit of a chorus effect. And it just kind of um, expands the base to the sides a little bit. That's it. So in like what, five minutes, once you know what to do with the, with the libraries, good to go. So that's the Grove. Let's do the exact same thing now with the Umansky and I will literally just turn this off. So let's open it up. Let's find a preset that we like. So it's kind of funny. It's taking me a little bit of time to pick the, the preset that I like here. Um, let's try it again. Okay, now you can clearly see that I am making moves to try to get to the type of sound that I liked with the Grove. Um, so it might stand to reason that I would just prefer to use the Grove on this mix and not try to like put a round peg in a square hole here. But this sounds pretty cool, so let's move forward with this. And you can clearly hear the clank on top of it, right? Uh, the, Click, 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 click. You can hear the, 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 the attack of the bass cutting through all the, all the guitars. So, the exact same thing now. Let's start with the EQ. And let's just dunk this to default settings again. It's literally the same thing. Um, we don't have to do anything in the mids this time, though. But we might need to boost the high end a little bit. But I'll do the exact same stuff you, you just watched me do with the Grove bass, I think 5,000, yeah. Cool, um, I increased the, the the upper frequencies here to help the, the attack come through more. But I really like the clean sound of this. It's not bothering me at all. So now I'm going to do double tap. And we're done with double tap. Throw in the micro shift. There we go. So this is, um, by the way, I know you guys are going to ask in the comments, these drums are the drums that Glenn Fricker has been talking out about for at least two years. 
They're done. I beta tested them. They're awesome. They're coming out soon. That's all I can say. I can't show you anything. Can't tell you anything else. I'm sorry. Uh, the guitars are my Valve State and my uh, Invaders amp back there. All going through an angle cab. And that's it. Um, Submix, just EQ, tape machine, Ozone. So no studio magic here. This is exactly what it sounds like. So this is the, the final comparison that I'm doing here is I'm just adjusting the volume so that you guys don't have the, oh, louder is better. So this is a more fair comparison and I should probably turn the processing off. Okay, so there you have it. Um, the, let me bring these back up. The Grove and the Umansky. Uh, which one should you get? My opinion, uh, whichever one you like the sound of. If you prefer the sound of the Grove bass or, you, or if you want the clank uh, of the Umansky, there you go. Those are two great ways to make the decision. If you're an actual bass player and you double thumb and you know how to do all that stuff, Umansky has those articulations for you. You can do that. All right. If you don't need that, you can go with Grove. Okay. So every library has in the submission audio uh, uh, library, just come on, words, words, Scott. In the entire catalog, there, that's a good word, of submission audio, there are different base libraries and they all actually do different things. Uh, if you actually go to the submission audio website, they do have a, so, um, a comparison chart that you can check out. And I would not be surprised. Um, if you might realize that you don't need Umansky, you need Grove. Or you don't need Grove, you need Umansky. It's all based on what you're doing musically and what you want out of your bass and what you need articulation-wise. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's my opinion. I mean, the, both libraries are awesome. They're fantastic. Um, I bought, like I said in the earlier the video, I have bought nearly all of Submission Audio's catalog with my own money before they reached out to me to pay me to make this video just to talk about and compare these two libraries. So uh, there's no conflict of interest here. I'm not lying. You guys have seen my videos for years. I've been using the Eurobase and Submission Audio stuff for a long time, okay? So there's that. Um, anyway, so links for these are down below. Uh, also down below are links for all of my training courses. You know, if you wanna know how to create guitar tones like this with amp sims, uh, that's down below. Uh, Program drums like that, also down below. Mixing, also down below. I have a lot of stuff down below uh, that can help you with your mixing and tone crafting, all these things. Um, supports me, uh, helps keep the channel going and my family secure. So if you have any questions, need any help, links down below. So that'll do it for this video, guys. Hope you have a good one. I'll see you in the next one.